Now for the next part of our celebrations, we are now very honoured and delighted to have Sister Sylvia Bay, our Dharma advisor, to give us a talk. And before I do that, can I offer a short bio of Sister Sylvia Bay? She has dedicated herself to the study and practice of the Buddha's teachings since 1992. She holds a BA Honours in Buddhist Studies from the Buddhist and Pali University of Sri Lanka and was a lecturer with her alma mater. She also has a Master's in International Public Policy from John Hopkins School of Advanced Studies. Since 2001, Sis Sylvia has been a regular speaker on Buddhist doctrines and their practical applications at local and regional Buddhist organizations. In 2013, she published her first book, Between the Lines, an analytical appreciation of the Buddha's life. And she's now working on another book titled, Towards the Light, the Buddha's Guide to a Heavenly Rebirth. So today, we are very honored and very well delighted to welcome Sister Sylvia Bay. She has put a lot of research and effort into this talk and in addition to putting her whole heart into the Dharma Foundation course in the Buddhist Fellowship, she has also prepared this wonderful talk for us. So without delay, may I present Sister Sylvia Bay and the topic of her talk today is The Lesser Known Tales of Buddha's Inspiring Life, Part 1. Sorry, it's Buddha's life shouldn't be completed in one day. <laughs> we are really trying very hard to summarize. You know, Buddha led an extremely eventful life. It may well be just 80 years, but it's 80 years of one great man's life. So, two-part series is really nothing. <laughs> okay, um, I'm extremely joyous today. Thank you very much, Sayale for a, a most profound and, and a touching Dhamma talk. I, I really enjoyed it and for your blessings. We are all very grateful for your presence. So, without much ado, let's go on to the Buddha. Okay, the reason why I needed two parts is because it's a lot of ground to cover today. And um, we take a quick look. We're going to look at his life, the real story. And then I'm going to focus on that aspect of the Buddha's life that means the most to the generations that come after. You see, when we celebrate a man's life, it is not just that he was born and then he did some things and then he passed on. Because we all go through the process. All of us. When we talk about achievements, or we talk about the good work that someone has done. It's really the legacy that he left, that the, the individual has left for us. So today, my talk will really cover more about him, the person we should know, and his legacy. So the, the second part, this evening, is where it gets really interesting. This morning, it's... In fact, this morning, you, I may cover grounds that many of you are familiar with. But this evening, for sure, we're going into an area that is really less known. Okay? Before we start, I thought I should start with a slide that asks ourselves the question, why? Why, if we want to know the Ma... Is it so important that we know Buddha? Why do we need to know history? And, the reason, and my answer to that question is because in this teaching, we have to have faith. Faith in his teaching. Faith in his message. And to have faith, you've got to know him better. How do you have faith with a completely unknown entity? That is why throughout history, one of the first things that people talk, the teachers of the past, one of the first things they talk about is actually the life of the Buddha. To introduce an ancient personality to the audience of the time. The difference between the ancient on the audience and us is that we have grown up in an age 
of science. So because we are all science-based, we question, we challenge assumptions. So this audience, the audience of today, is not like the ancient audience. We should happily just swallow every bite of fictional mythology. The audience of today goes for facts. You tell me facts. You tell me solid data that I can use so that I can understand him better. So it is a much different, much more diffi difficult task for the, for the speaker, the teachers of today. Okay. Now, why is faith important, right? I mean, we have always said that the Buddhist Dhamma is not a, just about faith, but yet there is this contradiction, this constant emphasis on faith. Because our teaching requires us to make seismic, seismic shift in how we act, how we speak, and even think. You think about it. The Dhamma is not just a set of things for you to do. The Dhamma really is about transformation of ourselves. And when I use the word seismic, I use it very, very, very deliberately. We have to change very significantly from our habits, how you talk, what you say. This is just habits. Do very deliberately, we become wholesome. In, in not just average way, national average, we go... We go to as high as we can go in terms of wholesomeness, in terms of giving, give everything as much as we can, okay? And why would we do that if our faith in him is tentative? You have to believe in him, absolutely. Then you're prepared to do what it takes to realize Nibbana, to realize his teaching. If your faith in him is tentative, I know him superficially, then your faith is superficial, that's fundamentally the problem. Okay. We must not forget the fact, and today has been said many times, Bang Hong says 2,600, I say 2,500. Whatever it is, it's a long time ago. How do we relate to someone who lived thousands of years ago? He's older than my grandfather, great-grandfather. Many times our grandfather, right? How do we relate to him? You think about it. We don't even relate to our parents. And we say generational change, different generation. This is how many generations ago. And, and yet, we must have faith in this man who is older than your great, 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 great grandfather. And we don't talk about generation gaps. It's very weird, isn't it? But yet, there it is. This is what we have to do. Relate to him. Relate to his teaching. Identify with him, identify with his teaching. Achan, Sujat, Achan Brahmali said last night about Buddha being a man in his lifetime and so we can identify with him. We're going to push the boundary today to a lot more to get you to know Buddha the man and to get to know what he had done in terms that we can identify with, okay? So, let's start off with Life of the Buddha. This is the Pyrenean story. Lah. I, want to, I want to highlight this. This is the popular narrative, which means to say, all Dhamma classes everywhere around the world is likely to talk about these things. He had a wondrous birth. And as soon as he had, was born, he could walk and he could speak, right? And then we talk about the destined greatness. There were fortune telling about his life, that said that he has two destiny. Either he becomes a universal monarch or he becomes the Buddha, right? You, you all have heard of that story, right? No? Yes? Yes. You talk about, uh, we also know that there was this prediction that if he were not to see four sides, he would, he would stay on in his lay life and become that universal monarch. So the father got him married. I call it grounding him in marriage. So if you're a father and you have a husband, you're a husband and you're a father, then you must provide for a family. That's, that's, a, that's the regular thinking, right? 
And then we hear about how he fled in the night on the horse that scaled the wall with one bound. Better than Superman, okay? It was the horse. And then he battled with Mara on the Enlightenment night. Oh, oh for, we forgot. He struggled for six years, but hardly anyone talks a lot about that. The only thing he thought he struggled. And then on this wondrous night, he battled with Mara. And it was, uh, it's, uh, uh, if you read my book, it will, it will tell you it's a cinematographic type of battle with rain and thunder and lightning and the ground got involved, Mother Earth got involved, and so on and so forth. And then after that, and, like, and, and, then, and then he was enlightened. And then very few, very few stories after that. Right? From enlightenment to the point that he passed away, that period, you have heard periodically in tea, in, in, in a, by, by speakers here and there, you have heard. But there isn't this, this framework of story like there was before enlightenment. Right? You know all these stories before enlightenment. But after enlightenment, you kind of have an idea what he did. He was a great teacher and it's just an idea and then there's not a lot more to go by. So this was a story that has been told to generations of children and adults. Generations. But was that really his life? Was that what he wanted us to remember him by? And this is, by the way, in one of the suttas. Huh? All these stories, it was taken from a sutta. Now, let's go by the facts. Pali Canon where we take a lot of the information from about his life, actually has very little details, biographical details on his life. And most conventional narrative, all those stories, uh, actually the details, a lot, a lot of the details all came from commentarial literature compiled centuries after his time. And there were embellishments. And you remember what I said about generations of speakers always telling the Buddha's life story to relate him to the audience of the time. So the intent was to foster faith. An ancient audience loved magic, psychic powers, do all kinds, all kinds of story of psychic powers. They love it. That's why the ancient speakers had to talk about these things. And I said, it can be useful for the ancient audience, but today in our world could be counterproductive, right? Because I have heard, I know of people who had told me, sure, no, those things happen, uh, seriously. So they're not very impressed. And then they take it as another fiction, another mythology. Mythology, you know, Hercules and his don't know how many tasks, I forgot. <laughs> and so on and so forth, okay? Now, what do we really know? And this is where I'm providing some facts. We know he was born, indeed, in Northeast, uh, Northeast India, by the foothills of the Himalayas. I put that in quote because that was what Buddha said. He, he said, himself said, he was born by the foothills of the Himalayas. So the scholars very cleverly put it in at the border of modern day India and Nepal. So that was correct. How do we know Ashoka knew? Ashoka visited his birthplace. So Ashoka lived about a couple of hundred years after Buddha. If you want to place it in time, think of 18th century Victoria and you. The gap, it's only a couple of hundred years. It's not so far away. So there will be father-to-son kind of, of a sharing of information. It is not just listening to ancient legend. It is listening to your father and your, his father say, oh, the Buddha was born there. Okay, so people know. We know his clan was called the Shakyan. Shakyan, not Sakyan. Shakyan, rich, proud, fierce, Warriors, they are Shastriyas or Katiya, they own land. So you can say they are glorified farmers. 
farmers with the, who own their own land and then other people will till the land for them. But we also know they till their own lands. So they were, the, they were, they were warriors because in ancient time, the warriors are the ones who got the land. So they are ancient warriors. What it means is the Buddha probably knew martial arts of sort. Not, not your Jack Lee type, but he would have been able to fight because it was his heritage, his birth. Okay? And Shakyan, the Shakyan were known to be proud and fierce. They had a reputation. Because everywhere the Buddha went, and he talked about, oh, he was from the Sakyan clan. Even the Chinese call him Sakyamuni, right? The, the Mahayana version. It's, he is the sage of the Shakyan. Okay. And as the, the Sakyan had enjoyed political autonomy, but they were ultimately vassals, accountable to the powerful Kosala kingdom. So the idea here is they were not kings. They were not prince, princes. They were powerful, they were autonomous, but they had another king, King Kosala, Pasenadi, King Pasenadi of Kosala. That was their boss. Okay? And what do we know? So that was his heritage. But what do we know about his life? We know that the father was not a king. He was a tribal, he was a member of the tribal council. Not so exciting to call Buddha son of a tribal chief. So much more exciting to call him son of a king, right? And not just the tribal council, they took turns to chair meeting. So the father was just a member and probably at some point he was chief of the council. Why is this important? Because the Sangha was modeled after this formula. In this formula, they all sat together and they vote at meetings. Sangha, one man, one vote. Democracy was practiced in Sangha way before your time, way before our time. <laughs> the US didn't invent democracy. <laughs> Buddha did. <laughs> or rather, his family. Or rather, at that time, Sakyan were not the only, the Sakyans were not the only democracy. There were a few other republics, or uh, should I say, uh, confederacy. I'm not, I, I'm not sure of the political term, but the idea is there were all these tribes, and there were many of them. One of them was the Shakyan, okay? What do we know about his family? We know his mother did die at birth, his birth mother. And his, her name was Maya, it was mentioned. We know he got married and had a son, Rahula. There were a couple of suitors that the Buddha delivered specially for him. We know Buddha had half-siblings, half-siblings. And we know it was a large extended family with many cousins. We know that. So the Buddha was used to living with many people. Okay? He was used to it. He found it tiresome, okay? Buddha wasn't very happy at home, so we, he, he, was, he found it tiresome, just too noisy, too many people. He had said that. It's dusty and so on. We know Buddha was the eldest son, so we can assume that he was groomed to be a leader, to sit on the council, at some point replacing his father. Because this is a family council. Everyone who sat on the family, who sat on that council was one extended, one large extended family. So your uncles and your nephews and everyone, guys only, sorry, no girls. So all the uncles and nephews and whatnot will be the only ones sitting there yelling at each other if they don't agree, okay? We have some hint of his physical appearance. He was lightly tall. He was slightly powerfully built, so he's stocky. We think, uh, so Buddha wasn't skinny. So one thing, and he wasn't fat. He was strong looking, okay? And we think he was really good looking. Because so many people fell in love with his face. There were people, there were monks who joined the order so that they can gawk at the Buddha. 
Yeah, he was really good looking. We know that. But he was normal looking, meaning he didn't have a bigger than usual tongue. He didn't have more teeth than necessary. He didn't have all these funny elephant shape thing. He, he didn't have any of those. He was a normal, regular, good looking, Bollywood good looking man. Okay. And I, I said in my book, maybe he got blue eyes. I'm not sure. Now you say, huh, Indian with blue eyes? Afghanistan, northern part, northeastern part. He's from the Aryan stock. They came from Central Asia. You go look at Central Asians, you do have people with green eyes and blue eyes. Okay? So you can just imagine how good looking the Buddha was. Handsome young man, newly married, rich, famous family, and he left lay life. And he left lay life for nothing, you know, for, meaning he left for a life of nothing. We can surmise he was well-educated, trained in martial arts, I mentioned earlier. Okay, I use the word martial arts loosely, but the idea is that he can fight. Don't underestimate Buddha, okay? Doesn't all need magic powers. He led a wealthy, privileged life. This was what he said. His life, his family was so rich, they got colored coded lotuses. You look at that. I was delicately nurtured, most delicately nurtured. And just in case you don't, you missed the point. Yeah. Extremely delicately nurtured, meaning he, learned, he lived an extremely privileged life. In modern equivalent, he could have driven a Porsche, a Lamborghini, okay? best quality, hand-sewn leather. Look, his, I told you, Lotus Pond made just for enjoyment. You know how frivolous is that? You know, I read a book that said, modern day household, if you are landed property, you usually have a little garden lawn okay it's called a lawn a garden this idea came from the west it didn't come from china it came from the west and why why are you so frivolous to have a piece of land that you don't grow grow food any land any land can be used to grow food and in ancient times in fact for for thousands of years people will grow food but when you are so wealthy, you can just grow grass. High class grass. If you are so wealthy, because what you are telling the world is, I got money to throw and burn. I don't need this piece of land to feed me. That's the idea, okay? You look at the Buddha. He doesn't have grass. He got lotus pond. <laughs> He's dig a whole pool of water, plant flowers. And they are in color coded. One pawn blue, one pawn red, one pawn white. You know how much effort to look after this pawn of lotuses? He used no sandalwood unless it comes from Kasi. Kasi is Pari of ancient India. The material there, high fashion, high society. The softest, the lightest. By day, someone carry umbrella for him. And it, they just so make sure that he is so comfortable. No dew, heat, cold, no weather, no temperature, no nature will settle on him. He is well coisted. And this was the man that Atam Mali last night said, there you sleep in the forest floor naked. This was the man who left his house to lead a life where he might have to sleep on forest for naked. He did. You will see the, the thing afterwards. He got three mention. This is real. This is from his, his book. Uh, his, his teaching. Called Delicate. I've got three mention. Three houses. One for winter, one for summer, one for rainy. Why so, why so difficult? Because the, the, the shelter has to be constructed specially to deal with the weather. The, in the Indian weather was so bad, they had to be specially constructed. And he gets entertained. Netflix. 
For three months, he's lived in this luxury. He doesn't even leave the house and he was entertained left, right, center, ate the best. His father's house, he said, in my father's residence, his servants get choice rice meat, choice hill rice meat and boiled rice, meaning good food, proper food, not broken one. Okay? This was how rich Buddha's family was. What we don't know, just so that we are clear in our mind where the facts and fictions are. What we don't know, actually, is when he was born. Okay? You have dates given to you. And these dates were put together by scholars. They were trying to figure out where. Because, I told you before, ancient India, people do not celebrate birthdays. And then at the same time, they're also not very good record holders. Huh? They don't write very good records. Today, even today when you're doing research, right? You know where, where we get material from, from the scriptures? And from Chinese record. The Chinese are very meticulous in, 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 in keeping record. They keep record of what they eat. Who keeps record of what they eat daily? Of the palace, I mean. Uh. But the ancient Indians actually do not keep very good records. Quite messy and hardly any there. So the result is we're still trying to figure out. Okay? Fifth, sixth century, you, know, you will find books of scholars, uh, scholars arguing both ways. Can be fifth, can be six, and they do they, and, and they argue very well. So you get quite confused. We don't know the Buddha's name. Siddhartha was not found anywhere in the Pali Canon. So you see the power of commentary. And why is it you don't know his name? You think about it. Today, if you're referring to a teacher you absolutely respect, would you use his name? We will call him by the name that the world knows. Right? Especially Sangha. You, at some point, you will lose the original name. And then when you write the book about his life, there is a high chance, and this is ancient India, but even today, there is a high chance you may or may not mention the person's name. But ancient India, you can imagine that name disappear. It's irrelevant. So actually, the record, the Pali Canon, did not record Buddha's name. Okay? Record his son's name. It didn't also record the wife's name. We only know they were cousins, but we don't know the wife's name. So your Yasodhara is a much Yasodhara is a much later addition. You know her as Rahula Mala, uh, Mata, the mother of Rahula. So the son is more important than the mother. We don't have details of his childhood, except in the in, in uh, bits and pieces that he mentioned. So there was no one, no swan shooting down of swan and all. There wasn't that story. We don't know. Maybe there were but it, it was not mentioned, okay? We know he got married. We know he had issues, not with his wife, but with the general meaninglessness of a lay life. As he himself put it, he subject to death, decay. Why would he be seized by objects which are also subject to death, to decay and death? So why did he renounce his life, his lay life, at the prime of life? We know he renounced 29, there about, there about, okay? He didn't leave the house because of four sites, the famous four sites. The death, the old age, sickness, death, ascetic. He, didn't, he, he himself never said he renounced because of foresight. And in his own words, he said this, Amid such splendor and a delicate life, it occurred to me, and in an uninstructed whirling, though himself subject to old age, not exempt from old age, feels repelled, humiliated, disgusted when he sees another who is old, overlooking his own situation. Now, I too am subject to old age, not exempt from old age. Such being the case, 
if I if if I were to feel re repelled, humiliated, disgusted with seeing another who is old, that would not be proper for me. When I reflected thus, my intoxication with you was completely abandoned. Before my awakening, when I was still an unawakened bodhisattva, the thought occurred to me, and this is why he left. Household life is crowded. See what I said earlier? It's living amongst extended family. Dusty road. Life gone forth is open air. In other words, living at home for him felt claustrophobic. Whereas the life out there, open air. It isn't easy living in a home to lead the holy life that is totally perfect, totally pure. What if I, having shaved off my beard, my, ha my hair and beard, put on an ochre robe, were to go forth into homelessness. The Sutta Mahasachaka Sutta, Sachaka is actually truth. Truth. And you think about it, here the Buddha is saying that household life is claustrophobic. That of the homeless is open. It feels liberated, open. And it's easier for him to live, to lead a pure life. His choice then was to renounce lay life. Okay? I just quite emphasize this. It wasn't too, it wasn't prompted by thoughts of saving humanity or foresights. It was, I think, I put words in Buddha's mouth now, driven by a desire to regain mental balance, equilibrium. But, the point that I want to stress is that it took tremendous conviction, profound courage, phenomenal willpower, and deep inner strength. You know why? You ask yourself. You ask yourself. We live in lay life. All of us, all the few of us here, live in lay life. And our lay life is nothing like his. None of us here drive a Lamborghini. None of us here live with color-coded lotus ponds and very special rice. But we can't. A lot, we, can't we can't just give up everything, family and, 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 and stuff, material possession, and just leave. We can't do that. We have fear, right? Why do we want to earn a living uh, to provide for my family? Why do you want to provide for your family? If you cannot provide for themselves, eh? Or cannot. What happens if they can't handle? So, in all of us, we have fear. The Buddha left, despite having led a wondrous life. He went out. He had no roof, no material things, no help. He was alone into the ancient forest. Ancient forest. This is not Singapore's Bukit Timah Hill. This is an ancient forest where there are a lot of predators that can mark on him in one gulp. And he went. Oh, we're all scared of what? Centipedes and all, right? <laughs> he has a lot more than centipede to worry about. <laughs> okay, now, he left. He's out there. And one of the first things he did was to look for a teacher. I, 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 made, I wanted to highlight this part because there are things to learn from his spiritual quest. Okay? Let me tell you the story first. This is from the Arya Pariyasana Sutta, the Noble Search. Huh? He went out, he looked for a teacher, he came to... His first, his first effort was to go to med for meditation. Now you ask yourself, what is your first effort? When you say, I'm looking for Dhamma, what do you do? You look for a teacher. You check out online reading material because today you can. You go for a retreat and you learn under teachers. None of us here assume that we know the answer. Right? And the Buddha is the same. When he went out, he assumed he had to learn from someone. He assumed. And he chose one of two methods. In ancient India, those are the two methods for liberation 
liberation of the mind. One was meditation, and two was extreme asceticism. Okay, I just put in the two teachers: Alara Kalama, Udaka Ramaputta, Ramaputta, the son of Rama. So scholars have pointed out that it wasn't Udaka himself who realized this method of meditation. It was the father. And Buddha learned from him, got the meditation right, and surpassed his teacher. So these two teachers, after the Buddha had successfully learned the method, they offered him, one of them, the first teacher said, jointly we run this, this school. And the second one said, you, you, be my te you be the leader of the school. Okay, whatever it is, he was clearly a gifted student. This is meditation methods. Buddha was master of it. But at that time, he wasn't. He was a student. And this student, within months, actually, we don't know exactly how long, but it's a short time. It wasn't like for many of us, right? 10 years, 20 years, still KLKK around the same point, right? Buddha wasn't like that. Buddha went in, chop, chop, realized, got it. And then he asked the teacher, any more? Then the teacher said, sorry, that's it. This, this one limit. I hate limit. And the Buddha went, this is it. This is all you have. Okay, it's not done yet. I have to go on. So he moved. He left. It was very clear. He was clear about his goal. He didn't get what he wants. He moved on. Okay? And that's where he started. Extreme asceticism endured for six years. And he almost died. This part, I'm not sure if you are aware of how close the Buddha came to death, which is why this is my favorite. This is my favorite picture, which you can buy. The statues, right? You can buy in Evergreen and so on. Look at what he said. Because of eating so little, he wants to defecate or urinate, he fall over. <laughs> he has no strength to keep himself upright. Because he ate so little, if he tried to ease his body by rubbing his limbs, which means he was cold. He ate so little, he was freezing. So he rubbed and his hair fell off. It was really, really quite bad. If you read this particular, oh, by the way, if you read this sutta, Mahasiddhananda Sutta, right? You read the sutta, you read it carefully. You can really feel the, the, the he, because this is his own words. You can really feel his struggle. Okay? I, I left out all the gory details. In my original draft, I actually had a lot more gory details. A lot more, a lot more of the things that he did. I will just give you a sample. And one of the things he said was he went about naked, went about crawling on, on, on forms, he did all kinds of things. Okay, read my book. And then, luckily, okay, now I come the good part. Luckily, he stopped. He realized something was off. He stopped because if he had not stopped, he really could have driven himself over the edge. Okay. Although, he said, <clears throat> although Tyler's energy was aroused, unremitting mindfulness was established. So, so you see uh, these two parts. Uh, what are they? Virya, Sati. This is what he's saying. I had Virya, I had Sati. But the body was too exhausted. Too exhausted. He, whatever that could be done, he had done. He pushed himself to the limits. This is, um, this is basically whatever that could be done using extreme asceticism, I had done it. It didn't work. He couldn't do it anymore. Okay? Fortunately, he stopped. He had this intuition that it's about the jhana. In other words, the mind must go quiet and calm. But to go back to that jhana, it's not possible. It's very, very hard where the body is so emaciated. So he had to take food. He has to eat something. And when he did eat something, his five, his five uh, 
companion friends decided, you backslider. Then they pack up and they left. So this is the part which actually was hard for me to understand. If you are a practitioner, you know that your friend is in a bad shape. Do you just pack up and leave? Even if you think that he is nonsense, your practice is hopeless, right? You must at least wait for him to recover something so that he doesn't fall over when he, when he pee, you know? You know what I'm saying? But no, they left. You know, this part, I want you, I, f I flash all these stories for you to bear in mind certain insights, okay? And I will talk about those insights later. Story of the Enlightenment Knight. Okay, this is the exciting one. We all hear about how he fought Mara, right? But you look at what he said. This is, the, the, the story that people tell is the big fight with Mara. But he himself, his own words were, I'll give you the whole thing. Uh. First watch, 6 to 10 p.m. Knowledge of past life, recollect to a hundred thousands, many eons of cosmic contraction expansion with names, families, physical appearances, food, experience of pleasure and pain, manner of death. I need to speak about this. From just this, stance, this, this short six lines, a lot can be said. Number one, when a person recalls past life properly, they have details. That's point one. Point two, what kind of details? You look at the details, then you look at your own life. Today, uh, if I ask you, talk about your life, you will talk about your name, your family, you won't talk about your physical appearance unless you are super narcissistic. Otherwise, you won't talk about, oh, I'm this good looking fella, right? You won't. But, but you will talk about food. You will talk about experiences of pleasure and pain. Nobody talk about that yet unless you are there already. So actually, it is interesting. He's flagging out the parts about life that people remember. You don't remember brushing teeth and bathing unless you fell in the bathroom. But you will remember what you ate last night and where you find the best food and have a compilation of list of where you get the best food. Okay? And you will talk about your pain, your pain, your pain, your pain. And sometimes you talk about what is fun. Agree? So this, this, this is the, for one who can recall past life, what he remembered most of that life, he will recall. That's what it means. The second thing, which is the thing that tells me Buddha was right. He, he wasn't, he wasn't uh, pulling a fast one here. Was this point, cosmic contraction and expansion. Nowhere in history, in history of men, there was never mention about cosmic contraction and expansion except in the 20th, the late 20th century, when, when astronomers starting, start, started to look at the, you know, the Huber, the Huber telescopes and they could see to extreme distance, then they can observe. Mathematically, they can calculate cosmic expansion and contraction. But this is not something a normal human knows. So you ask about science, this is science. How did he know if he had not seen it? How did he know about cosmic contraction and expansion? So this is the unique one. The second watch, 10 to 2 a.m., he talks 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., he talked about having the knowledge of the working of driving forces of rebirth. In other words, he saw for himself karma, operation of uh, the karmic consequences of action. Because he said he discerned, he could see how beings were born and how they passed on according to their karma. 
he witnessed other beings birth and rebirth. The two, the two period is not the same. Huh? One period is he realized that life doesn't end at death. Life continues. So there is a force that drives life to continue. That's the first watch. The second watch is what determines rebirth. And he saw how beings, because of their actions, when they passed on, they take on a new life because of the actions driving them. He saw the forces of rebirth. Okay. What condition rebirth? Then the third watch, which is what makes it special. One and two, anybody can do. Three, only the Buddha and the Arahan could do. Three, the third watch is what makes Buddhism, the Ma, so unique, which is the knowledge of the destruction of defilements. How do you cut off? How do you cut off all that made it possible for a person, for a being, for life to be reborn? He saw how to snip it decisively. And he did it. And then he realized Nibbana. That's the uniqueness of that third watch. And after that, enlightened. Now, these three watches you found, you will find only in his own teachings, only in his own words. It is not a story that people tell. So how many of you know that when they tell stories to the little ones today, they talk about the three watchers, the little one all fall asleep, joining the Buddha in the watchers. Because they the first watch, second watch, third watch, you fall asleep. Not so exciting as, oh, fight bara, okay, market, pay armies, oh. it's so exciting, you can even depict it on stage. But this one cannot. How do you depict a person's mind? <laughs> you can't depict. So it wasn't very exciting, not very sexy, you know. So the result is, this is not commonly known. But these, these three knowledge, knowledges is what make Buddha, Buddha. So you must know. For anyone who wants to know him, you must know this. Okay? Okay. Take away. How is it relevant to us? Be modest and be open to learning. I, I love what uh, Bante, uh, Ajahn Sujato said last night about keeping fresh ear and a fresh mind whenever you listen to suttas. Always. Even if you have heard it many, many, many times, you maintain that freshness when you hear it again. Because the moment your mind says, I've heard it before, it shuts to learning. And why do I say that? Bodhisattva Gautama. Gautama is the name of his family. Okay, The clan is called Sakyan, right? But the surname, surname, the family name is Gautama. So Bodhisattva Gautama learned from others. I told you, he went to teachers. He didn't set out and left house and go, ladies and gentlemen, here I am, Buddha. I don't need to learn from anyone. One. I will realize on my own. He just wait. He didn't do that. He went straight to learn from someone. But we have to be clear about objective of spiritual quests. We must never lose sight of our end goal. What is the end goal of our quest? It's Nibbana. Cessation of Dukkha. The objective of our spiritual quest is to realize how the mind can experience cessation of dukkha. And therefore, it is about intimately, intuitively knowing the four noble truths. Fundamentally, it's just that. And it does not matter how many times we hear people talk, we hear the Sangha talks about the four noble truths, we must listen with fresh ears. Again, something there, again. The conditions are right for your mind, 
when this new time of talking about the noble truth, something will stick, something will stick, something will spring up, something will awake, will be awakened in us. Okay. So Buddha did not stop at meditative attainments. I told you, right? His levels were very high. There are all in all eight levels of meditative attainments that a regular non-arahan can, can experience. It's eight levels. He hit number eight. He could have stopped because he was told this is the highest, no more. But he said, no, there is no cessation of dukkha. My mind is still in dukkha. It is not, this is not it. So he went on. So only when you are clear what you're looking, what you are, what you're seeking, and, you, and, and you're clear and you know that it's the correct one, then it's correct. Otherwise, your teachers say what you follow. <laughs> oh, that was a lovely one, isn't it? <laughs> yes. So otherwise, whatever that your teacher said, you may just follow. And you're blindly following the teacher. You must always bear in mind, our practice is about cessation of dukkha. As long as your mind experiences some dukkha, you are not at the end. It's as simple as that. Okay? Always reflect wisely and correlate experience with the teaching. That's how, so the point is, you remember I said, he intuitively knew something was wrong. Then he stopped pushing his body. He took a breather. He ate some food. He reflected on his practice. Then he said, you know, this is all wrong. I think it has to do with the jhana. Did his U-turn, start a new direction. So what I'm saying is, for the rest of us seeking Dhamma, you must always look at your own experience and correlate it with what the Buddha was te the teaching. And if you don't see that correlation, do recognize something is wrong. So then what does it mean? You have to be familiar with the teaching. You have to know the sutta. You need to know what he said about the practice. And then you constantly correlate it to what you observe about mind and body. That is important. Okay. Otherwise, you won't know you're on the wrong track. If you don't reflect wisely and correlate with the teaching, you may not even know you're off track. It's like, think of it this way. I want to go to Ang Mokyo. I've never been to Ang Mokyo. Or, or Potong Pasir. I've never been to Potong Pasir. I don't need to look at map. Like, I can do it. Or I look at map. I look at it wrong way, which has happened to me before. You look at it in the days where you're still looking at paper map. Then you look at map. Then you go and he says, now I should see a school. Then you look, no school leh. Never mind. I, school pawn torn down already in your mind. You, you rationalize. Then you walk. Now I should see a post office. I don't have post office. Never mind. Maybe post office also torn down already. Then you walk. You are not looking at the map. You're not correlating the world to what you are taught. Then of course you will end up completely lost. The idea here is you must constantly reflect and correlate with the teaching. Have courage, build confidence and resilience. Okay, what did he do? Buddha, you know, today, today, we see Buddha's triumphant as amazing, marvelous. It's so complete. You are so, you're so proud of him. You're so happy for him. But you know, when he started out, he didn't know he was going to succeed. Today, we may say that, oh, but it's prophesied he will succeed. You know, my you fortune teller. But Buddha didn't know. He really went all out without knowing he will surely succeed. He never knew. He only knew when it was done. But he was going to go on about it. He wasn't going to give up. That's the point. He wasn't prepared to give up. He would never give up. He said, he actually, there was this, that he himself said, uh, he tied this uh, when he was going to, to he, he was going into the practice like he was going to battle. So they tie, I, 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 I'm not sure about the ancient India, but apparently they tie something around their waist. And this is a symbol that they're going to fight. He did, he, he had that 
that, that, that gesture. I can't, I can't remember the name of it. He had a gesture. So the, the gesture says that I will fight to the end. That was the idea. For details, read my book. It's there. I forgot the name. There's <laughs> so many things to read. I forgot that one. <laughs> right, so he was prepared to die trying, okay? Now, this is very important. To be upright, to be honest about your practice and insight, you must be prepared to admit mistake and change course. Why? Six years there. He did six years pushing his body to the limits. Then he cut his losses. Did his U-turn, which cost him five companions. It is not funny. You must, you must always put yourself in his shoes. You are alone. You have no help. You're not even sure when you'll get the next meal. But you've got five friends with you who are all egging you to kill yourself. Jia you, jia you, they are telling you. Don't eat, don't eat, jia you, jia you. And I'm going to die. <laughs> you know what, I'll just eat something. Then they say, hey, you got no standard. Then they left him. It's not funny. This is really, this is really scary. This is really painful. But he did it. It's like admitting to your friends you got it wrong. You think you are a jhana. They suddenly realize none of this is jhana. You could admit you're wrong and start again. It takes a lot. Okay? And this is enlightenment, the enlightenment speech. He directed it to the knowledge of the destruction of the taints and he, ex he directly knew as it is, this is dukkha, it's the origin of dukkha, this is cessation of dukkha, this is the way leading to the cessation of dukkha. So this is the knowledge that I must know. Dukkha is because of craving. Cessation of dukkha is possible. This is the practice. And then when he knew that, he got... This, this is not a talk about the Dhamma, so I will not elaborate on this. I will, I will share with you what the Buddha said. I directly knew birth is destroyed, holy life has been lived. What it means is... I've done it. Birth is destroyed means he has realized deathless. Holy life has been lived means he has done his practice. He has carried the practice. The objective of the practice has been achieved. The objective of his practice has been achieved. He has done whatever there is to do and he will not be reborn. That's, that's the idea, okay? No more coming to any state of being. He is not reborn. Okay. Buddha had strong, initially, he had strong reservations to teach Dhamma, initially. He felt the world was not ready. He said, it would be, he, in his words, in Pali, of course, wearing and troublesome. I considered, he put this it, I considered the ma that I have attained is profound, hard to see, hard to understand, peaceful and sublime, unattainable by mere reasoning, subtle, to be experienced by the wise. So Dhamma, profound, hard to see, hard to understand. Hard to see, hard to understand. How do we understand things? We think, we think, we work out logically, right? If you, if you ask yourself, how do you understand things? You will argue. First, you might look for material and you have that material. And then you will reflect on the things and you think about the concepts and you construct logically and you arrive at a, a, a conclusion. All right? That's one. Another one is you have experienced it. You tasted the food. You can say, this is spicy. You have tasted it. You have experienced it. 
But you see, what he is saying, what he was saying is, it's hard for you to, you may have the experience of life, but your takeaway from the experience may be wrong. It is very hard for you to realize exactly what the experience means. The ma is not magic. Okay, there's nothing magic about the ma. The ma is an explanation of your life experience. But yet, we read his book, we study hard, we practice, and we may not get it. We may not get it, and then we go, what does it mean? Then we, 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 we think very hard, we think very hard. So you're trying to understand something which is very sublime and profound. Not, you can't explain it. You have to experience it. But if you experience it, but you don't identify correctly, you don't understand correctly, then the experience is past. Okay? If you actually do experience the ma on a daily basis, but you don't realize it, you don't think it correctly, you don't have the correct takeaway, the experience is over. It's like mindfulness. You think people don't know mindfulness? Everybody knows mindfulness. Even the little ones know mindfulness, but they don't know it is mindfulness. They don't realize that this state of mind is called mindfulness and you can, you can create the conditions and then you experience the state. You can revisit the state again and again at will, but they don't know that. So because you don't know that, you cannot do it. It's the same thing. So the ma, the experience of the ma is part and parcel of the nature of the mind. But you don't realize it, you don't call it the ma. Now, poor Buddha... Just, okay, in case you're wondering what this means, you think about it, okay? You have a profound experience. You know it is significant. Now you're going to tell the world. Now you're going to tell the world. Your first instinct is, who am I to tell the world? Nobody's going to listen to me. And this is what he means. This is his reason for holding back. Who am I? I'm 20, what, 35. I'm 35 years old, black hair. In a culture that is ages, ages means they honor the old, the elderly. They do not respect as much the young. They don't listen to the youth. This is a culture that only respect gray hair. How is he, black hair and all, going to stand up and tell the world, I will teach you the Dhamma, which actually tells you at that point when he started, right? This sentence tells you he hasn't quite figured out how. We all call him the greatest teacher ever, okay? And he was, he is. But at this point of his life, when he was trying to see whether or not he will teach the Dhamma, at that point, he hasn't figured out how to teach yet. That's why he said, it's very hard, leh. It's very hard. How am I supposed to teach this? Then he went on. This generation delights in attachment. Repeated three times, delights in attachment, takes delight in attachment, rejoices in attachment, repeated three times. And that is not just this generation. Generations of us, delights in attachment, takes delight in attachment, rejoices in attachment. It's very hard to see the Dhamma Namely, specific conditionality dependent origination. It is hard to see this truth, namely the steal, the stealing of all formations, the, the relinquishing of all acquisitions, the destruction of craving, this passion, cessation, nibbana. Now, let me ask you guys, especially the ones who have gone for retreats, who has spent many sessions learning the Dhamma, all these words, the stealing of formations, the relinquishing of acquisition, the destruction of craving, these three, do you know what it means? Don't smile like that. Lah. Okay, I don't know you are smiling, but I can see from your eyes you are. Yeah, yeah. Stealing of formation means what? The mind. 
Uh, yes, but actually one step back. Stealing a formation. So this formation is Shankara. The thinking, don't think, 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 think. Let the mind settle so it doesn't think, 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 and talk, 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 talk. Okay? Stealing a formation means the ability of the mind to stop narrative, thought formation. And the relinquishing of all acquisition means whatever you see, whatever you think, you own it. Whatever that you see, you hear, what you experience through your sense spaces, there is a part in you that says, I want, I know, I, I must have. So relinquishing of acquisition is a mind that, uh, that agrees, that is willing to let be, see, let go, see, let go. There is that part. Destruction of craving goes one step deeper. They are all deeper and deeper. One step deeper. Destruction of craving is the force that is very instinctive in us. The very instinctive force of grasping, craving, wanting. Seeking taste. Whether it is taste of the world or taste of the mind. You say, mind got taste, man. Your mind, you seek knowledge. The thirst, the thirst for knowledge, the thirst for experiences. This is what it means. So the mind stops constructing, thinking. The mind let go of what it perceives to be I, mind, me. And the mind comes down and, and, and slowly releases and let go of this thirst for, for, move, for, for experiences. Okay? And if you don't hold, the mind starts to become equanimous. This passion has that equanimous quality. And then you, 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 you begin to experience this no more holding on no, and this letting go becomes more complete. And then Nibbana, okay? So this was taken from Majjhima Nikaya 26. Arya Pariyasana Sutta. The Buddha had reservations. He wasn't sure. So what changed the Buddha's mind? This part, you must, if you can, bear in mind carefully. The words he said, uh, out of compassion for beings, I survey the world with the eye of a Buddha. The Buddha's eye is not like ours. Our eyes has filter. We all have filters, likes, dislikes, preferences, right? We all have preferences, we all have biases, we all start with a view. So when we see something, what we see is a corrupted version or a filtered version. Corrupted has a bad connotation, but it's a filtered version. Whatever you see filters through your lens in here with your biases, with your past experiences, the assumptions that you hold. Buddha does not have, did not have that filter. The eye of a Buddha is a mind with no filter. He will see as is, no filter. So surveying the, no filter means no biases. Objectively, pure. Pure, the insights that arise will be pure, okay? Surveying the world with the eye of a Buddha, he saw, I saw, beings with little dust in their eyes, with much dust, with keen faculties, with dull faculties, with good qualities, with bad qualities, easy to teach, hard to teach. Some who dwelt, seeing fear and blame in the other world. This line here is very important because it is a description of all of us. This is us. The world is us. And whether you like it or not, you belong to one of these categories. And this is not how many categories are there. Does, faculties, qualities, easy, bad to teach, dwell, okay. Five sets. It is not five sets. You yourself can have a few. You could be little dust or much dust. You, if you have, and, and, and you might have 
keen, quali keen faculties or dull faculties. You may have wholesome and wholesome qualities. It, it, can you see this? This is you. You could be one half, and you get combinations of these. And what do they mean? Thus, is how much you are your filter, how thick or thin it is. Some people say, oh, dust is about the, the stain of the mind, the, the stain, the staining of the mind. Yes, but actually, it is about how you see things and understand things. Is it easy for you to catch the Dhamma, understand the Dhamma, little dust? Or very hard to see the Dhamma, much dust? But why is this dust? Because if you are caught up, by your own filter, if you're caught up by your own narratives, you can't see. Your lens, your mind lens is too thick. It cannot see. Do you understand this? Let me explain again. Huh? When you try to explain to someone the Dhamma, there are some people who can intuitive understand it. They get it. There are some people who, they keep filtering it through the mind. Then how like this? Then how like that? Then how like this? In the mind, it's talking. So your Dhamma is coming in, but the mind is resisting. If your mind resists, you have a lot of dust. This has nothing to do with your faith. You can have a lot of faith, but you still have a lot of dust. You're not open-minded, like, in other words. Some people can be very close-minded. Very close-minded. Some people, they're very receptive. Okay, so that, this, is a, this is about the dust. Then the faculties are actually the mental conditions. So you see, what's the difference between this and the dust? Your mental condition is a bit different. So you have like chaga, sada, viriya, sota, and all these, all these wonderful words all right, in English. You have generosity, you have patience, you have uh, kindness, you have metta. These are all mental states, mental qualities. Now, Certain faculties are very helpful for enlightenment, which the Buddha will call the seven factors of enlightenment. These are the very critical qualities for realizing the Ma. Okay, the seven factors of enlightenment. So if you have much of the, the faculties, you have you have faith and you have energy, virya, and you, you have uh uh, sati, samadhi, your mind can go very quiet, very still, very alert, very aware. Uh, th those are the koala, the faculties for enlightenment. Faculties for enlightenment, okay? So imagine very little dust, excellent faculties, good qualities, wholesome, unwholesome, easy to teach. Hey, jackpot already! Matter of time! Yeah, you shoot jackpot, okay? Who dwell seeing fear, blame in the other world means you don't want reborn, to be reborn. There is a part in you that holds back and says, you know, I don't want anymore. The, the idea is you must have the correct conditions. And he realized that there are beings out there who can do it. They have, so he now has been able to differentiate. What does it take for enlightenment? Little dust. Keen faculties, easy to teach, wholesome qualities. And there is a part that says, you know, I don't want any more rebirth. He, he, he knows there are. Now, people will say Buddha taught, Buddha came out to teach because of compassion. No. This is only one part. It is out of compassion, he scanned. Out of compassion, he scanned. Then he saw, yes, there are all these beings who can get it. He know how to tweak the qualities in people's mind. Okay, let's do it. Okay. There are those who can realize beings with the requisite mental conditions, i.e. little dust, keen faculties, good qualities, receptive and conscientious. These are the beings that he was looking for. So today you ask yourself, do I have what it takes to realize Nibbana? Then you ask yourself, ah, little dust, much dust, keen faculties or not, wholesome or not, receptive or not. 
conscientious or not. Okay? Oh, actually, I'm supposed to end here because there's a whole chunk. Should we take questions now? Yes, we can. Thank you, Sister <laughs> Sylvia, for a very engaging and captivating talk. Really a fantastic talk for Vesak Bay indeed. Are there any questions from our volunteers from the Dharma Hall? Brother Taiwi looks like he's... <laughs> okay, uh, since you know, there is one from, uh, uh, from online, from a Sharon, a member called Sharon. What should be the first book that I should get? I believe she may be talking about um, the Dharma book. Is it a Dharma book? Oh, uh, okay. I, I will share what I what books I read on my way here, on my way to this this actually many books. Um, there is a book written by Wapola Rakula called "What the Buddha Taught." Right? What the Buddha taught. I think it's a good book. It's a very good book, and it's really a classic. It's a classic book. Uh, explains very well the Dhamma, the teachings in the Dhamma. Personally, you see, books are of, let me see how many kinds. We, we go by the genre, the, 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 the different category, okay? There are the books on life of the Buddha. If you haven't read mine, do. A lot of research went into that. It's called Between the Lines. But I'm not advertising for myself. You, uh, you can, by the way, you can get the book online. Okay? You type Sylvia Bay and Between the Lines, it will come out. And it's free. Those are books on the life of the Buddha. Okay? And there will be other books, biographies. I think there is one a German, I think, German writer. Great Disciples of the Buddha. I think it's called. I, can, can someone please check the, the, the author's name? Lovely details on uh, the lives of many of the disciples. So that's one set, the biographical types. Then there are the books on the Dhamma. And books on the Dhamma, I, I, I just suggested uh, Wapola Rahula's book. Um, I, I used to read books by Narada. Narada's book is called, I think, uh, can somebody check the title of Narada's book? <laughs> I read it 20 years ago, sorry, I cannot remember the title. But these are the basics. Then there are the books on the suttas, i.e. the, um, the teachings of the Buddha in, his, in discourses. So you, you call it the Anguttara Nikaya, the uh, numbered, the, the number discourses and then the, the connected discourses, some yutta nikaya, long length discourses, diga nikaya, and then of course majima nikaya, uh, middle length. And the translations done in my view by uh, Bhante Bhikkhu Bodhi, it's really classic, really classic. Then you say the books are very expensive. Go online, Sutta Central. Go to Sutta Central. Many, I think, I, I, I happily just hijack from Sutta Central the many of the discourses. Why are the discourses used? Because this is the words of the Buddha. The, the teacher himself teaching thousands of years ago are captured in the Nikayas. And I think all Buddhists should should pull out these discourses and take a good look at them. And you say, oh, but they are very thick. Start with the Dhammapada. I think, I, I think uh, Ajahn Sujato, uh, Ajahn Brahmali also suggested referring to the Dhammapada because it is stanzas and if you come across the one with the stories, the stories are also entertaining. Okay? Next. Uh, thank you, Sister Sylvia. The books are Helmut Hacker, The Great Disciples of the Buddha, and The Buddha and His Teachings by Narada. Yes, thank you. Uh, and um, we also have uh, another uh, question. Actually, it's a similar question. 
a great talk as always, says Sylvia Bay. Thank you. Question, what sutta book would you recommend to someone who is getting to know Buddhism for the first time? So I think it's a similar question. Uh, another one is, how to clear the dust from our eyes? <laughs> Do what the Buddha did. Go for classes. <laughs> Your start point must be to go and learn from someone. And I think there are many great teachers out there. From uh, the Thai tradition, there are several. Ajahn, uh, Ajahn Sujato, Ajahn Brahmali, Ajahn uh, Jayasaro, Ajahn Sumedho. There's a lot of Ajahn. When you see the word Ajahn, you know they are Thai, Thai tradition. You, you see the word Sayado, it's the Burmese tradition. You see the word Bante, it's a Sri Lankan tradition. So that's how you tell. Okay? <laughs> There are, there are a lot of teachers out there and they're all online. The best part is they're all online. At the touch of a button, you can learn from any of them. Okay, thanks. Or you can come to Buddhist Fellowship and join <laughs> in our Sunday service. Um, okay, another question is how to increase our chances of meeting, meeting the Triple Gem again? Ah, this is easy. This part is easy because if you, you see, what you impress on the mind, what you constantly impress on the mind, when it is time to move on, the mind will seek out what it's familiar with. So you want to be reborn into, the, in, into a, a world where there is a triple gem and you can return to the triple gem, you must constantly impress it on your mind. So for instance, if every day you bow before the Buddha Rupa and you chant and then you make your aspiration, may I always return to the Dhamma, then the odds are you will return to the Dhamma. We all came back, no? If you think about it, we all made it back here, no? To the, you, your predecessors must have, must have made the, the aspiration on your behalf. May we return to the Dhamma. So you're back here? Okay. You, you do your chanting and then uh, you, you make the aspirations. You want to increase the odds even more. You go and learn from the Sangha. You go and learn the Dhamma. You read the suttas. You reflect on the suttas day in, day out. You go for retreats. I can almost guarantee you have tied yourself to the Dhamma so much you cannot help but come back. <laughs> so the more... The more you impress on the, upon the mind, the stronger your odds of returning to the Dhamma. Okay? Thank you, Sister Sylvia. Another question is, why do all beings in the world follow different religions? You know, if you look at the world, right, how many cuisines do you have? As many cuisines as there are people, ma? And in the same way, you will have people from different cultures, different places, referring to the world around them and from what they see of the world around them, find an answer. They will come up with their own answers. Even the Buddha came up with his own answers. The Dhamma was discovered by the Buddha. We, we know it to be an ancient path. It's an ancient teaching, meaning to say it's timeless. It's been there for a long time. It's been there for millenniums, eons, contractions and expansions of eons and so on. It's been there. In, it, it receded in memory or upfront, but it's always there. But when it has been forgotten, you still need someone to find it. And the Buddha's job was to rediscover it, okay? And in the same way, all over, throughout history, throughout civilizations, you will have people looking at the world around them, trying to find an answer to the pain, the fear that they encountered. Religions are born out of man's fear, man's, man's need to explain to himself the world around him. And that is why in all civilizations of the world, there is not one that has no religion. 
everyone had. Whether it's a tribe somewhere in, in Australia, the Aborigines or the Maoris and Maoris in, 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 in uh, New Zealand, South America, there are many, many uh, ancient cultures. They all have it, all of them. They have their, their goals and they have their explanation of how the world came about and, how, and what is man's place in this world and so on and so on and so on and so forth. Everyone has it. So actually, it's to answer religion, to answer man's needs for, for clarity, for explanation, why things bad things happen, how do you ensure good things, what can I do to improve my odds of living well. Isn't that about Dhamma also? We also have that element. How do you improve the odds of, of a good life? How do you protect yourself, guard yourself against misfortunes and so on and so forth? It's normal. Okay? It is, it's normal. It, it's like cuisine. You must satisfy men's taste buds. So everything about the world is about satisfying desires. Everything, including religion. Okay? Yes. Thank you, Sis Sylvia. I think that's all for the questions online. Okay. Now, the... the the reason why I stopped here, I mean, I could go on. There are another 20 slides, I think. But I have to stop here because this, I thought, was a good place to stop. Because subsequently, we're going to talk about his, his teaching, his, his searches, the, um, his life as the Buddha. When he started to teach, whom did he go after? what categories of people he went after and what did he do as the Buddha all the way to Parinibbana. Okay? So I thought I'll just stop here. Are we good? Yes, we are good. Thank you, <laughs> Cecilia. <laughs> um, thank, you for the, thank you for the fantastic talk again. Thank you so much. Uh, Brothers and sisters, that was part one of the talk. Uh, do tune in again this evening at 7.30 p.m. when Sis Sylvia will be back again to present part two of her talk on the lesser-known tales of the Buddha's inspiring life. That will be part two.